Hello everyone, my guest today is Mike Maxwell, the owner of Imperium Press, who has brought out a lot of brilliant books, including my own Populist Illusion uh, over the past few years. Got a brilliant new book out himself called The Cultured Thug Handbook. Uh, it was an honour to have him back on to discuss it, but I would uh, strongly recommend, I mean, if you found yourself a little bit lost about some of the concepts that we've talked about, if you you know, need to get up to speed, if you feel like you don't really know what anybody on this side of the internet is even talking about, this is the one shot. Uh, this was basically a book waiting to be written, and I can't think of anybody better than Mike uh, to have written it. He's one of the very few people that when he has a new piece out, I will always, um, you know, take time out to listen to what he's got to say, and I can count those people on one, two hands, you know, um, so I, I, he, I've always held him in great regard and, uh, it's fantastic that he's brought this out. So anyway, before we get going, I'll just remind you promo code merit 25% off all courses. I won't subject you to Peterson. Pick up the trivium and all the other great courses today from the academic agency. You get 25% off. You might as well do it. You've got about a week left, but without further ado, let's hear from Mike. Well, hello everyone. Uh, pleased to have a guest joining me today, Mike from Imperium Press. Uh, Imperium Press has been around for a good number of years now. Uh, when did it start, Mike, Imperium Press, just uh, out of interest? Uh, it launched in September of 2019 with the uh, publication of the Iliad. Fantastic. And, well, I mean, there's lots and lots of good books um, that, that you've released over the years, including um, my own Populist Illusion, of course which uh, to date is easily my best-selling book. So th thanks for that, Mike. Um, but <laughs> you, you, for the first time, you are releasing uh, a book that you have written yourself. Uh, this is not any, it's not Homer, it's not Parvini, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's Mike Mac Maxwell himself. And it's called The Cultured Thug Handbook. And when this came through the door, I wasn't sure uh, quite what to expect. But when I looked at the contents, I just thought yes this is it you've done it you've, you've kind of done the um i mean I, i'll tell you when people come through the door here there's so many times they're like oh well what do, what do you stand for are you left or right i can't really tell like what are your ideas you know and um you know it's, it's like well it's, it's too much to explain but <laughs> now i've got a book where i could just say like yeah I'll just give give them this book and I'll be like, read that and come back in two weeks and then you'll understand. <laughs> um, so why don't you tell us a bit about uh, what this book is, how it came about, and uh, why should we, people should be interested in it? Great. Well, uh, thanks for having me. And so the book is a an ex basically it's an explainer of the radical right wing worldview. Um, as filtered through the concepts that we use. So the kind the um, the concepts and like words and you know uh, phrases and and whatnot that you'll find in the radical right uh, that have currency, you know things that are uh, somewhat of like inside baseball language. It's um, you know an important part of building a scene and in some ways, uh, building a folk hood that we kind of have our own language and our own, um, you know, inside jokes and things like that. I mean, none of the stuff in the book is are jokes, but they're concepts that are very commonly used uh, and invoked in right-wing discourse. So, you know, if you say something like the cathedral or the high-low versus middle mechanism, or even things, uh, it's, that are a little bit wider, like the deep state. Um, if you're using these terms and talking to somebody who, you know, say has been on um, on your show or is just like in as part of our scene, they'll pretty much understand what that means. I mean, there might be some things that they're not quite, uh, you know, don't quite understand. Um, but this is, book is basically an explainer for all that stuff, as many of the major ideas as I could think of, 
And in the end, I came up with 45 of them. Uh, and it, so it's an explainer book, first of all. And second of all, it's an explainer book that is couched in very straightforward, very plain language. The vast majority of what's in this book will be intelligible to somebody who hasn't, you know, they don't have a bachelor's degree in political science, um, nor do they have years and years of like autism in telegram chats or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's basically an entry point for people who are completely un uninitiated uh, to the radical right. Um, uh, no, sorry, sorry to interrupt Mike, but um, this is something I greatly appreciate because it's, I mean, it's something I've always tried to do in my own writing. Um, you know, even, even when I was writing uh, books for the Academy, like properly academic books, you know, uh, uh, REF rated four star research type books. I always tried to write um, for the layman and my, uh, my kind of litmus test was always, could I explain this to my mother or could I explain this to, um, and that's not, that's not like having to go with my mother, just somebody who does not have a background in this, right? Or somebody who just is a, you know, is outside of the field. Can they understand it reasonably quickly? Um, and I, I really do think that is an underrated thing, something I try to teach on the foundations of writing as well. And I, I appreciated that. Uh, the, the other thing I just want to say really quickly before you continue is that, uh, I mean, you talk about r radical radical right. Uh, I, for a long time, I've, I've preferred the term <laughs> sensible center. And um, the, the, the reason for that is something that you actually talk about in this book, which is that, I mean, I've always thought that we are the ones who basically have the natural, normal, the kind of, his, you know, the historical norm view on so many topics. And when I say the historical norm, I'm talking thousands of years, right? Thousands of years. And it is really our political opponents who are proposing things that have never been tried, never been tested, uh, things that are completely out of whack with how people have, uh, I mean, the most extreme case, of course, is something like, um, you know, trying to disrupt the sex binary of male and female, as, as an example, right? These have been stable categories for hundreds of years. Along comes a progressive with their hubris, believing they can overturn this in the space of one generation. Now, now I even back when this was new, I, I, I knew they would fail in this because <laughs> there's only so much you can do with the um the, the plasticity of human beings if you want but do you want to say a little bit about that like who is really who is radical and who is the center because i've always seen us as the center and the uh the government of this country uh britain as being the extremists yeah absolutely this is something um that i actually mention in the preamble to one of the sections in the book which is that, um, you know, it, we call it radical right. And um, of course, that term is just how we're, we are understood uh, in the mainstream. But really what we should be calling it is the deep center, kind of the opposite. It's, mm -hmm. you know, because we are the historical default. We are the null hypothesis against which liberalism needs to justify itself. Because liberalism, uh, you know, going all the way back to classical liberalism, which I, you know, it's my belief that it has only just now uh, worked its way to its true, like what it actually entails. This ideology is the most extreme ideology in the history of the world. Um, and for it to call itself the center is absolutely absurd. Um, what we call our liberal tradition is just as revolutionary as Bolshevik communism and more. It, it contains communism and it contains worlds inside of itself that have only now just kind of come to fruition. So we are the real center and uh, liberalism essentially needs to justify what it wants to do against us. 
and uh, this, you know, there's several chapters where this is referenced. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the Chesterton's Fence chapter, mm -hmm. uh, but yes, very much so. We are what you might call the deep center. Uh, but you know, if I was to put a guide to the deep center <laughs> on the co on the cover, nobody would know what the heck I'm talking about. <laughs> they think it was a guide so, to Blairism, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although that might have been a, a good sort of like Trojan horse. I yeah. just figured that I would be a little bit more straightforward about it. Fair, fair enough. So, uh, what are some? Well, why do you talk us through the structure of the book and some of these um, some of these chapters? You know, some examples of some of the chapters. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, the book is basically split into three categories. Which, when I was, you know, coming up with the um, all of the different concepts, it kind of emerged as a natural sort of way to sort them out. The first of the three categories is what I call the 10 step program. Now this is an ordered list of 10 concepts that basically get you from the simple fact of noticing that although Donald Trump was on paper, you know, the highest power in the land in the U S from 2016 to 2020, despite that, he wasn't actually able to govern. He didn't have any real power. Um, he very nearly went to jail. Uh, so just noticing this anomaly in how the American governance structure works, that's the starting point. And I think that anybody that isn't sort of like hopelessly comp compromised uh, can start there. So that's the beginning. We start with uh, Carl Schmitt's state of exception. That's the first concept. And through a course of 10 steps uh, that kind of just work you from there to like abandoning liberalism, essentially, over the course of those 10 steps, uh, it's kind of like an Alcoholics Anonymous type program where you, you wean yourself off of the fake conservatism of uh, you know, classical liberalism and liberalism of all stripes. And at the end of it, we are, have basically bid farewell to this ideology that's strangling us and has been for you know, centuries. And that gets you on to the next section, which is a set of illiberal concepts. So the second part of the book, the illiberal concepts is just literally that. It's the concepts that we use in our discourse, kind of like day to day, you know, you'll, when somebody mentions something like bio-Leninism, or the proposition nation, or anything, or anarcho tyranny, anything kind of like that that has a currency in our circles, um, falls into this section. So there are a number of different concepts here. Some of them are actually not specific to uh, to like the radical right per se, but they are framed in our understanding. So one of those would be the uh, you know, differences between particularism and, and universalism. Uh, another one would be something like the proposition nation or localism. There's a number of them in here that we kind of take and frame according to our understanding. Yeah, no, Mike, I, th I think it might be helpful for people if I just read out the names of the chapters, right? So I'll sure. do, the, I'll do the, the 10 step program first, right? So we've got the state of exception, the deep state, the cathedral, high, low versus middle, Noblesse Oblige, Cheston's Fence, The Lindy Effect, N. Doxa, uh, Darwin and the Work of Circumstances and What Liberalism Is. So that's the 10-step program. And then illiberal concepts, we've got particularism versus universalism, the proposition nation, sovereignty, bio-Leninism, the progressive stack, frame, the kosher sandwich, corporatism, localism, uh, anti-utilitarianism, accelerationism, anarcho-tyranny, environmentalism, physiognomy, and nationalism versus globalism. I don't know why physiognomy made me laugh, because it's uh, one of the truest things that anybody ever talks about. But anyway, yeah, carry on, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah that, that, I like that chapter, actually. Um, so the next section after that are the big ideas. And this actually, it's the third of three sections, but it's really about half the book. And what these are, um, are a number of different concepts that, again, the, the name is 
uh, used very often in our circles, uh, and or sometimes it's not, but it's a concept that's invoked nevertheless. And each one of them is sort of filtered through the use of the term or the interpretation of one of the greatest thinkers of all time. So it kind of goes mostly chronologically. It starts with Homer and what I'm, I've called oikophilia, which is really just um, the love of the familiar, the love of what's close, the love of home. It's essentially kind of like the basis of nationalism, it's the, really. It's the flip side of oikophobia, which was coined by Rogers Crusoe, is that right? That's right. Yeah. It's yeah. basically like it's it's basically xenophobia, but framed positively. Mm -hmm. um, so it starts there in, you know, 2700 years ago, and it kind of works its way forward all the way to Alastair McIntyre uh, with his book After Virtue, uh, explaining the epistemic and moral dependency of reason on uh, embodied traditions. Uh, so that section which again is about half the book is like the essays are a little bit longer a little bit more detailed um and it kind of just takes you through really the history of ideas and by the time you are finished this book hopefully uh, if i've done my job properly the effect on the reader is going to be that we essentially own the history of ideas that really um everybody who is important in you know in intellectual history in philosophy in literature uh in all of these fields everybody who's really important kind of agrees with us hopefully that is the um overall effect that people get once they once they come to the end of this thing mm -hmm. uh so yeah no, that's so, an overview some, of what's in there some of your selections of the thinkers here i mean Hober, homer job heraclitus Aristotle, Confucius, Beowulf based, uh, Ibn Khaldun, very based, uh, mm. Robert Filmer, uh, De Maestra, List. I mean, uh, I was reading List again recently, uh, actually your your edition of it, um, just phenomenal. I love List uh, as, as an economic thinker, you know, Carlyle, Nietzsche, uh, Ragnar Redbeard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. I, in fact, I, I listened to the discussion that you did with Pete Quinones on that, and it was kind of interesting. That uh, the whole idea of might is right. Um, Veblen, Spengler, Heidegger, Schmidt, Evola, and uh, and McIntyre. That is um, not Aaron McIntyre, but the uh, Alistair McIntyre from right. After Virtue. Um, Mike, uh, just on the on the might is right point um you know that would may raise a few eyebrows but i think i think one of the interesting things that you've always been a, uh alert to is the fact that our current order especially the post 1945 order the the liberal order was not one in the market in the free marketplace of ideas it was basically they just no. won a war and therefore we are correct and everybody else is wrong it wasn't like it wasn't like they ever De de you know, de defeated any of the arguments. It was just like, I mean, they literally, you know, nuked two cities into submission in the Japanese case. And well, I mean, I need, don't need to go into what happened in Germany, but, uh, you know, starved three million people into submission and then psyop them for, for the next 80 years. So, I mean, it's not like, it's not like they ever won any arguments, these people. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the, you know, after all of the liberal arguments fall away, um, which they do fairly easily when put under any pressure, which is why we're completely censored. After all that falls away like dead leaves, the at the bottom of every justification for the current order is we won World War Two. So um, the thing is, might is right. Now, this isn't, people have asked me about this a number of times. So it's obviously, it's a chapter that does raise some eyebrows. And I should uh, preface this briefly by saying that I don't necessarily agree with every single idea in this book. There are some, like most of them I do, of course, but like some of them are not things that I would really stand behind or endorse. I think might is right is, uh, 
very ambiguous. It, it's, mm -hmm. it runs into a lot of danger if you try to make it a moral foundation, say. Um, but I, you know, I've tried to explain these as, as to steel man each of these ideas as much as possible, whatever my own feelings might be. But that said, with might is right, um, it is quite hard to dismiss because like I say, at the end of the day, any worldview uh, that is put under any real pressure, especially one that doesn't really have a, a serious foundation to it, like liberalism, will kind of retreat to a might is right. They'll basically say, well, if we're so wrong, why did we win? Um, and you know what? That is a valid, uh, that's a valid thing. That's like a valid a rule of thumb, say. Um, it's a question that really does require an answer. And I, I just find it very interesting that um, despite that, basically pretty much nobody will stand behind this idea except for Nietzscheans. Um, that and possibly, possibly Israelis in this day and age. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> But pretty much, you know, everybody else uh, it finds it to be abhorrent and a terrible basis for a worldview. But when you're kind of pushed to it, a lot of them will retreat to it. And you know what? Also, throughout the history of um, the world, basically, it has served as a, an ideological foundation um, before modernity. And it seems like the difference with modernity is it just simply wants to hide the fact that it's based on power. So uh, first of all, I wrote this chapter, not because I find the idea interesting, though I do, but because it's a, it's a concept that has currency. I wanted to limit myself to not just ideas that I think are great, but ideas that are actually, you will see them in the discourse. So this is one that I felt that I had to include. And I like the chapter because it's a little bit nuanced. It doesn't give you a definite yes or no take on this idea. There's a couple of them that are kind of like that, uh, but it, it just sort of like leaves it as an open question, I suppose. So it's a, it's a, it's a chapter that kind of sticks out in some ways. There's a couple of them that are kind of like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've got a lot more time for my is right than most people um, because I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> as I've said many times, a realist, right? So, I mean, let's just, if you take any situation, Let's take the situation with Russia, Ukraine. Okay, the the people who want to take like very very moral positions on that are just overlooking the facts on the ground. And the facts on the ground are one of the one of the lar the largest country in the world with one of the biggest armies in the world. You know, is not going to tolerate certain things happening on its border. End of. You know, so <laughs> you know, with the best will in the world. You know, there's certain realities that if you're Ukrainian, you have to take into consideration, right? Um, and this is an argument that comes up on our side of things, right? And it has done many, many times because there are people who argue about nationalism in the abstract, right? That every everybody has a right, you know, if, if somebody wants to declare themselves, you know, a uh, an ethnic group, uh, they've got a right then automatically to a homeland, and, uh, you know, this is kind of a, a nationalism in the abstract, okay? Um, whereas uh, when I look at the history of the world, it's a history of empires. And, it's, and, you know, for large swathes of history, there has been no, you know, small nationalism. So, you know, I've said a number of times, I'm not sure about the nationalism of smaller nations being a real thing. This, to me, seems like a luxury, a luxury belief afforded by the liberal order or something like this, you know? But, but anyway, I don't want to get too bogged down into that particular thing. But I'm just saying that might is right has everyday applications and it comes up all the time. Um, whether you kind of like it or not, it's just a fact, right? It's a, it's a brute fact on the ground that there are certain powers in the world and there are things that they're not going to tolerate. And you just have to kind of come, unless you're going to raise a bigger army, there's nothing you can do about it, right? Yeah, and I think that understanding some of the concepts that are in this book, specifically the chapters on sovereignty and uh, patriarchy, you know, which basically talks about Robert Filmer. Um, obviously, like patriarchy doesn't really enter into this specifically, but the idea of sovereignty 
uh, if, if, if just an understanding, a robust understanding of what that term means will really kind of dispel a lot of the confusions here because, you know, somebody recently posted on Telegram that uh, the U.S. has a law in the books whereby uh, if the Hague was to convict one of their uh, one of their officials of war crimes and was to, like, you know, arrest them and then put them on trial, that the U.S. actually has a law in the books that said says that it will destroy the Hague if that happens. <laughs> yeah, it's... It, it's just so <laughs> nakedly obvious, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it shouldn't be a surprise, though. I mean, no. it's only it, it only is like, you know, people are only shocked at that if they don't really understand what sovereignty is, right? Yeah, because, it, it, you know... It, it, the U it, 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 sorry, Mike, this is one of those things that is actually coming up on a, a almost daily and weekly basis, though, in Western politics, which is that somebody is elected to government, uh, let's say Donald Trump in America, or... Georgia Maloney in Italy, as an example, or even <laughs> Rishi Sunak as the Prime Minister here, a couple of months back, we've now got Starmer, of course, but they want to do something. Let's say they want to start the deportations, and some judge somewhere says, no, you're not allowed to do that. So a, ju a judge intervenes and says, oh, oh, actually, that's against the law. And the, the Prime Minister or the President then says, oh, okay, then you've blocked me. All right. And uh, this is a, one of those bizarre scenarios. It's like one of the kind of fail safes that the liberal order has put in. But all that's saying to me in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, viewing it through our lens and through these concepts is, well, the leader's not sovereign. That judge is sovereign. Exactly. The judge is deciding the exception, you know? So, sorry to interrupt, but... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that, that's the thing is, I mean, this is part of why I start the whole book off with the idea of um, he who decides the exception is the sovereign, right? Because when you understand that, uh, which is basically all that is, that, that point that Schmidt is making, is he's just explaining absolutism in a very, very succinct way. Um, as far as I'm concerned, absolutism is the only serious political theory as far as like sovereignty is concerned. And I think that when you understand that concept, when you understand that sovereignty is indivisible and that is necessarily above the law, that it actually is the font of law, then everything sort of falls into play. Everything kind of makes sense on, in the basis of that, right? Like in, in terms of the example that I, I mentioned before with the Hague, I mean, the fact is that America is the only country or one of the only countries in the world uh, that is truly sovereign. There's probably America, certainly China, uh, Russia, you know, you might be able to add Iran in into that as well. Where basically what they're able to do is to say is to tell other states, no, you can't, um, you don't have jurisdiction over our citizens, right? Um, so when the Hague tries to you know, arrest U.S. officials for conducting official U.S. business. It's kind of like, imagine if I tried to take the government to court, you know, like yeah. there actually is like a, uh, a legal principle that states that you can't do that, which, you know, from a, a sort of thinking about it for a minute perspective should dispel that idea, right? Because how can you, like, basically, when you, if you want to take the government to court, you're kind of like trying to overrule the sovereign, which basically means you're the sovereign, which obviously you're not. So, but, you know, one of the interesting things is that this concept is very widely misunderstood, even within our sphere, certainly in within the mainstream, like liberal society. I mean, it, it's probably understood, it's certainly understood in academia. Um, you know, political science and things like that. But the mainstream understanding of, you know, who actually governs is just, it's basically sort of like flat earth theory. It's its on a uh -huh. level with that. It doesn't make any sense, even for two seconds. Uh, and, you know, hopefully this book will not only explain, because absolutism isn't, is certainly not um, accepted by everybody in an hour thing. And it is just kind of thought of as ridiculous by most people out, even outside of the radical right. Uh, so hopefully this book will have go some way to kind of 
dispelling that <laughs> really um yeah, I mean, there's a number it, of things in there like that that was what i was trying to one of the things i was trying to do with populist delusion mike as you know which was basically to be like listen it doesn't matter if you call the system monarchy liberal democracy communism or anything else it's always the same it's always executive power decisionist first and foremost regardless of what you, regardless of what the system is called somebody decides the exception and it does not brook a contradiction to itself right i mean that is all power all power systems um and uh once you kind of i mean for me this is a kind of uh almost like a eureka type insight into mm -hmm. in, into everything really um and uh i mean i can always tell the people who get that and the people who do not get that um just just on the the role of the judge or the role of uh who interprets because this is something else schmidt says is you know who decides who interprets uh if, if you go back to, to machiavelli and the original uh you know some of his breakdowns of the origin of what a king is and things like that and even if you go back to P polybius and the, and, the, and the greeks the first king is also a judge right it, it actually the function of king starts with needing the person to dispense justice in the first place so that so the two roles of judge and king are actually much more closely intertwined than first meets the eye um and i mean in the medieval era they had uh, the king had a court a traveling court where if all of the other if all of the other um kind of legal systems that were up and running this is in england now medieval england um if they couldn't reach a resolution well they could try to get an audience at the king's court right the notion that you could go to the king's court and try to put the king on trial and ask the king to make a judgment on himself is ultimately what you're getting at here because that i mean it just couldn't happen which is a nonsense to ask the king to 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 make a judgment upon his own upon his own conduct it just didn't couldn't happen wouldn't happen and in fact was considered a contradiction because um you know he's god's representative on earth and god cannot contradict himself so anyway I, too much of a uh, tangent i suppose but uh, any other things uh, we, we've got about five minutes left here mike any other chapters you want to kind of draw people's attention to or what are you hoping that people will get out of this book ultimately yeah i mean there are, I mean, there's 45 of them, <clears throat> so <laughs> it's a lot to go through. I would say I, I, I've actually, so I've, I've got the EPUB is now available of the book, the ebook. And this kind of allows me to look and see like which chapters are referenced more often and everything like that. It's actually, when I, when I look at the ebook, I realize that this is really kind of a hypertext. A lot of it is referencing other parts of the book. It, it's, mm -hmm. It's very um, lends itself well to the ebook format. Uh, the chapter on sovereignty, which we've just discussed, is the one that's probably the most referenced. The second most referenced is probably the one uh, on the good king. So that's Beowulf. And that is in some ways related, but it's basically explaining how the idea of kingship is kind of considered um, on a par, really, with tyranny or dictatorship. And of course, dictatorship and kingship do share some things uh but the idea of that the king could be something good um is kind of alien to the modern world mm -hmm. uh, we believe that absolute power corrupts absolutely and this chapter is basically there to dispel that idea if again it's one of those ideas that's kind of considered ironclad like axiomatic in the modern world but when you examine it for even just a uh, for five minutes, it kind of falls apart pretty easily. Uh, so that's what that chapter is. Um, it, it's sort of like getting at. I would say another one that is quite important is this one, the first chapter of the the big ideas, the the last section, the one on Homer, uh, called Oikophilia. I think I would draw people's attention to that because it's my view that Oikophilia, the uh, sorry, o oikophobia, the hatred of what's familiar, um, is really quite close to the root problem of modernity. And it has been for a very long time. 
So, you know, this, so this chapter is explained in light of the Odyssey, basically. Um, what the Odyssey is thought of, uh, kind of in, even in popular consciousness, but especially going back to the Middle Ages when it wasn't actually that well read, it was sort of known more by, um, uh, like, you know, people sort of, they didn't have the text in front of them, so they had to go based on what they thought it was about. Um, it, the Odyssey is kind of thought of this, um, it's thought of as this story about a guy who goes on a bunch of adventures, but really the main story of the Odyssey is the homecoming of Odysseus. And what, the, what I think is the most interesting part is what happens when he gets back, when he, you know, because he's mm -hmm. been away at the Trojan War for 10 years, then he has like 10 more years worth of adventures trying to get back. And then he finally does get back. And what happens after that is for me, the, the really um, uh, important uh, part of that story, but it's also kind of thought of as like, Oh, well, you know, he's off having adventures and having fun and everything, but really he, all he wants to do, he just wants to get back to his home country. And I think that this is a good uh, metaphor for kind of where we're at in the West today, right? Where the the king has been absent for a very long time. We have all of these suitors, all of these, you know, people who are here that probably shouldn't be here, who are, you know, they're they're eating through our store, they're abusing, you know, our people, and the king is absent. And I actually find reading the Odyssey quite exhilarating because of course, anybody who knows what happens when Odysseus comes back knows that um, it, it's kind of a model for, let's just say, it's a bit of a model for, uh, for us today. But uh, yeah, the idea of oikophilia, the love of the familiar, the love of what's close and native to us and natural to us and what's been with us forever is kind of, it's, it's really the psychological and even spiritual basis of nationalism, um, which kind of sets itself at odds with some other ideas that have currency in our circles. I'm thinking specifically of something like Faustianism. The idea of striving and going beyond is completely the opposite. So you kind of have these poles in the Western soul, shall we say, the West, the folk soul of the West, if you can use that term. One of them would be Faust, uh, Spengler's idea of the man who strives beyond boundaries into illimitable space. And then you have this other side, which is sometimes not talked about all that much, which is Odysseus. And he's the man who just, who wants to return to his hearth, who wants to get back to what's familiar. And it's kind of, we think of, of Faust as kind of the paradigm or the Promethean as the paradigm of the West. But I think that's really truly incomplete, that that's actually something grotesque without the Odyssean, shall we say. Um, mm. I think that you need both and that the, the balance and dynamic between both is actually what makes the West great. It, actually something that Toynbee talks about, isn't it? Heroic uh, withdrawal and return. <laughs> You've got to, like the comeback part is important too. You've got to come back. Uh, but, uh, anyway, Mike, uh, where can people get this? Uh, and I mean, with Christmas coming up, this would be a good one to... If you've got a friend who's dipping their toe in, this would might be a good idea to to get them this to get up to speed. Because I mean, often when people come to this channel, they're like, "Oh, where do I start?" And I'm like, "Right, well, I've got about a thousand videos, so I don't know." <laughs> but this would be a good <laughs> this would be a good thing to get people up to speed in like one sitting, basically. You, you know, I mean, you wouldn't be able to read this in one day, but let's say you could do it in uh, four or five sittings. So where can people get this? Yes, uh, so they can get it at uh, the Imperium Press website. So that's imperiumpress.org slash CTH. We've made a really simple URL that'll get you straight there. You can get it from us. It's now available on Amazon as well. So, you know, I know a lot of guys prefer to buy on Amazon. Um, it, it helps us more to buy on our site, but wherever you buy it, um, just, yeah, I hope people enjoy it. Uh, if you like it, tell people about it. We, we're offering bulk discounts. So if you want to buy a handful of copies and give some out, uh, there is a discount available on our website to do that. 
And um, yeah, be sure to tell people about, about it. If you, if you get the book and you like it, please go onto Amazon and rate it. Uh, that really helps us out quite a lot. Uh, and it helps get it into other people's hands, which is super important for this book, especially because this is going to be a turning point for, well, I hope a lot of people, but it's definitely going to be a turning point for some who get into it and are kind of, you know, adjacent to us. So that's, you know, that's what it was written for. And uh, thus far in the you know week or two that it's been out, uh, the, it looks promising so far that people uh, are liking it for that purpose. So yeah, you can get it from us, Amazon, wherever, but uh, I hope people like it. And I just want to say thank you for having me on to talk about it. Great, yeah. I mean, the, the way I describe it from what I've seen so far, it's almost like a kind of summing up of the past 10 years, maybe, of on, of like that journey of discovery that so many of us have been on, uh, on whatever is called like this this thing that we're part of, um, but codifying it and putting it all together in a way that makes sense. So it was uh, it actually a great service that you've done for the entire community. So... I do hope people uh, pick this up and support uh, Mike. Thanks, thanks a lot, Mike. Hope it does well. Thank you. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe. You can join the channel for thousands of hours of past shows in the archive and hundreds of videos. If you have any questions, you can leave a super chat or a super thanks, and I'll be sure to pick it up during my weekly office hours, which run every Tuesday afternoon. I also provide courses at the Academic Agency, which I encourage people to buy. Thousands of students now have taken the trivium to improve their skills in writing, logic and rhetoric. Just three of many courses available. Buy it now. But most importantly of all, friends, get out.